Ah, all right, everybody. Everybody can hear me, right? Sounds good. All right, so today we're going to talk about zero cost abstractions, eliminating runtime overhead in Scala. So fundamentally here, the main thing I kind of want to point out is that many of the abstractions that we attempt to use today in Scala um, require some level of overhead due to, I, where do you say, um, missing features of the language itself. So I'm going to show maybe some examples in Haskell and how we could do this and how we can maybe try to find ways of shoehorning this into Scala. And then we'll go from there and say, can we make this not ugly, right? So about me, I'm a software development consultant for a company called Estatico Studios, which is literally a one-man company. So take it for what it's worth. Primarily, I do work in Scala and Haskell, but I think like most of the people here, I just love digging into new languages, right? Um, we love checking out new things, and usually static types are a big thing for me, hence the term estatico, which is Spanish for static. Although if you speak Spanish, you sound like doesn't move, but we'll ignore that. And if you're interested in collaborating, hit me up, carry at estatico.io. I'm also on Gitter, Kerry M. Robbins. I'm wherever else I'm sure you can find me. So, all right, let's talk about some zero cost strategies that we're going to uh, go over. So first, we're gonna talk about polymorphic values. Scala doesn't support this. Languages like Haskell do. New types. Real quick, who, are, who here is familiar with, with what a new type is? Raise your hand. Ooh, <laughs> this is one guy. All right, very cool, very cool. Ah, and this guy over here, I went and saw his talk, it was pretty good. Steven over here talking about opaque types. If y'all didn't get a chance to check it out, definitely check it out, it's a good talk. Um, and also uh, generic programming. So this is, who's familiar with shapeless? All right, more, more than people who are familiar with new type, very cool. Um, anybody attend the uh, Shape of Shapeless talk? Yeah, that, who thought it was an amazing talk? Good, it's the same amount of people, I think. I think one extra person might have raised their hand. Um, but yeah, no, so, so it's great stuff there. Um, so hopefully y'all got a pretty good idea of how that works. We're gonna go over, I'm just gonna kind of hand wave and gloss over the parts that aren't about zero cost. So, warning. We will be using the dreaded as instance of. Who's scared of this? Anybody? Good, yeah, we're not scared of it. We know what's going on. We're gonna use it a lot, but it's cool. All right, don't be scared. But you might say, runtime overhead isn't my bottleneck. And I might say, then get out. No, no, but seriously, usually it's not your bottleneck, and that's fine, but that, we're not trying to eliminate the bottleneck here. We're just saying, are there ways to make our code more efficient? Can we start from first principles and say, hey, are we making things inefficient for literally no reason? Answer is yes, and let's find ways to do that. But my premature optimization is evil. Yes, that is true as well. But we're gonna talk about ways in which our optimization shouldn't get in our way. In fact, they should, in a lot of ways, make our code simpler and give us new tools to use. So it shouldn't just be getting in your way. Also, we're talking JVM. So anybody use Scala.js? Cool. Um, I've only played around with it just to port some of these ideas over there because some people wanted it. Um, now, but to be honest though, uh, I, in checking it, it actually seems like a lot of these optimizations work pretty well in Scala.js, if not better, because Scala.js like inlines all kinds of stuff. Let's go over polymorphic values. Um, here we have the either functor. Um, everybody know what a functor is, right? Okay, let's, I'll just gloss over it, it's fine. Basically, we're just mapping over the right side of the either. Um, now, let's look what happens when we try to summon this guy. I'm gonna implicitly summon a functor of either. And all right, I got an instance of it. That gives us basically the address, if you will, of the instance. What if you summon it again? You get another instance. So it seems kind of weird because that definition's not any different depending on the next instance. And if, let's say you wanna do an either, you know, float of question mark, right? Um, it's gonna be the same implementation. So it's kind of silly that we're summoning new instances and the JVM is going to have to allocate and free those each time. So let's see, is there a way we could cache these? You're going to see something funny here. We're actually sticking a nothing in for the left side. And you might think, well, how is that supposed to work? Well, the functor is not operating on the left side, so it doesn't matter. And in fact, you can't use values of nothing. So it wouldn't compile even if 
you did try to do that. So that's where this works. And we're going to use as instance of to cast this to the L side. So this def simply calls back into the val. So each time we summon this implicit def, it simply calls back into the val and does a cast. And actually, that cast doesn't even really happen. But we'll talk more about that in a second. As you'd expect, when we summon the implicit, we get that instance, summon it again. Same instance. Yes, same address. So we're not invoking new ones each time. Yes? Ah, why does this work, you might ask. So, <laughs> um, so I'm getting to your question, by the way. I'm not just ignoring you. Uh-oh, another question. Um, okay, his question was what, sort of a question comment saying, is this because of type erasure? Um, and uh, yes, and, I'm, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second here. So you'll see type parameters are erased at runtime. So if we see this implicit def here, Let's look at what actually happens in the bytecode. Real quick, who has ever looked at bytecode? OK. OK, good, like most of us. Um, just as an aside real quick, because I think this might be kind of neat to talk about. Um, just so you know, if you've never done it before, you can easily check the bytecode of something in a scholar REPL just by doing this. And then you can go through and look at your generated method and it tells you what's going on here. So you can see it just loads a constant of string foo and then returns it. So real quick, you can use the Java P disassembler to look at that, and if you've never done that before. All right. So as we can see here, oops, let me go back. As we can see here, we're allocating a new functor instance in this def. And then um, that, that invokes specials just to init. It's just a Scala thing. It just has to init the constructor for the functor. Um, so every time we call this def, it's going to create a new functor. We don't want that. So why don't we look at what happens here? Well, what happens here is we're actually calling the def, but then we're just simply invoking the functor from here. And you'll notice that the type here is just functor. And here, it's the same type as the val that we're calling here, the cached one. So the interesting thing about this is, is that, like what was referenced here, the, the uh, generic parameter, the type parameter to functor, the JVM doesn't look at that. It doesn't track it at all. The only thing it really cares about is when it extracts values. It sometimes needs to check that type. And in our case, we're only operating on the right side. So it wouldn't have compiled if we tried to, you know, do something on the left side with it. So this sort of boilerplate gets on my nerves and I just want to get stuff done. So there's an easy way we could do this. We could use a cached macro that simply expands to this. And this macro can be written in about like four or five lines of code. It's really very, very simple. And I have some uh, uh, snippets of that that we'll be able to see at the end, or that I'll link you to. Uh, we don't necessarily have to go over it because it's not really important. But all it does is just generate that code there. And then you're good. And so you can write your original code like you wanted, but you could easily abstract this away. And it becomes pretty simple. Um, again, we want abstractions that allow us to just get things done without having to write a bunch of boilerplate. Um, so new types. Um, let's talk about what new types are. I'm going to talk about the motivation behind new types. So everybody heard of Haskell here? Some people who haven't? <laughs> if you've been here for the last three days, I'm sure you've heard about Haskell a few thousand times. So here we are, we're defining a new type called widget ID. And its base type is going to be string. So at runtime, this guy is going to be a string. But at compile time, it has a unique type of widget ID. So everywhere we want to use a widget ID, we can't pass a string. And somewhere where we expect a string, we can't pass a widget ID. The compiler will let us know we're mixing types where we may not intend to. So, and again, you may do this in, in your language of choice now by wrapping it in some other type, but you're incurring the overhead of wrapping and unwrapping that type each time. In, Scal or in, in Haskell, um, this is just a string at runtime. This is just the string A. Same here is that where we're uppercasing that string, this unwrap and rewrap are both eliminated at compile time, and at runtime you do not see them, right? So, so you get just auto good performance out of that. Uh, another nice thing about new types is that you can have specialized type class instances. So maybe you want to have your widget ID to have serialized to JSON differently than a string. So you can actually define your own type class instance. A good canonical example of this is integer. 
Integer isn't a great monoid, which basically means you know combining, appending things together. Integer isn't great because it could be, you could have the sum monoid where you use addition, and you could use the product monoid where you use multiplication. And so we can disambiguate that by using new types, and we're not gonna pay a penalty for wrapping these types, because again, this all happens at compile time. I don't know about you, but I wanna be able to use that sort of thing. Oh, here, here's the other thing. Let's consider if you have a list of string and we want to get a list of widget ID. Well, how you traditionally have to do that is map over the thing, convert each one, and then return out the list. That's an O-in operation, right? Well, in Haskell, you have the coerce function from the coercible type class, which will allow you to safely cast um, the list of string to a list of widget ID. And the compiler can say, okay, these have the same runtime representation, so we can do that. Now, in Scala, we have something called value classes. So here's like how we'd normally wrap this type. And of course, we know that this incurs overhead because it's gonna be a new class. So instead, we can add any val. But the problem with this is that it doesn't always optimize like we want. Um, but let's look at a case where it does actually do what you want, which is where you do get widget. Maybe this takes a widget ID. When you compile this, you're gonna see that the get widget actually takes a string. So Scala is smart enough to to go ahead and replace widget ID with string here. Now, here's a pitfall though. Let's say we wanna wrap it in option. Well, now what we have, we're allocating this new widget ID. This is not good, all right? This is not what we wanted. The reason for this is because if we try to extract that value, by the way, never use .get on option, but hey, it's just an example. Um, if you're trying to extract this value, we have to do a check cast, or, or rather, Scala has to do a check cast to confirm that it's the right type, okay? Um, in theory, it could be like, oh, well, you said it's this, so I'll just assume it's this, but it doesn't do that. So that's why the allocation occurs. Interestingly enough, it then does an unwrap right after to give you the string, so it makes me mad. Anyways, um, so here's our own conversions. Try doing this with, with value classes. If you have a list of string, you want to turn it a list of widget ID, you're going to have to do this. There's not really another way to do it. So, and by the way, the JIT, <laughs> don't even count on it trying to optimize something like this. It's never going to happen. Anybody heard of tag types here? Okay, so tag types were the first time I saw someone trying to solve this problem. And so this is adapted from Scala Z. And the way is, is that you simply say, okay, well, I have it some type A, and I'm gonna tag it with a type T. And you're gonna see here that it implements this as what's called like a refinement type. So really it just turns to be Java Lang object, but there's these inner types that just don't end up in uh, the compiled bytecode, the type tag and the type self. And we have this tag function that just does an as instance of. So we're just saying, hey, it really we're saying as instance of object, but the Scala C compiler is gonna say, okay, I'm going to remember that you want this to be A tagged with T. So far, so good? So the way we would do this for our widget ID is we'd create a trait widget ID tag, and then we'd create a type widget ID, string at at widget ID tag. Um, and then we could write a constructor using a method like this and call into the tag. So the way this actually works, we can look at it. Okay, when we do tag, it just takes an object, returns an object. It loads it and returns it. So, so far so good. This is the kind of thing the JIT can do really well. It'll say, ah, I just inline that. I don't need to do that. Let's look at our constructor. Same sort of deal. Um, it just loads in that string and then it calls into that tag, which is the same thing, right? It just, it's a load and return and returns out your object. Again, this is the kind of thing that the JIT can inline very easily. So this works out pretty well. Um, now let's look at option. Hey, this actually works the way that we want because we're loading in the A and we're just packing that in. And it's, and it's again, the JVM looks at this as an object. So it doesn't need to, to create a new widget ID or you know, do a check cast pulling it out. It doesn't have to do anything like that. It already knows that this is, it's saying, oh, well, this is an object. And all that type information is only a compile time for Scala C. So again, we try to extract this, it's seeing just object. So it doesn't need to do any check cast, it doesn't have to do anything, it just works. You could do the same thing with the conversions. Again, because at, at, at runtime it's just a string, you can do as instance of yourself and go ahead and convert your list. As you see, load, return, no big deal, can be inlined. 
Now, this, you know, I tried using this, and um, this works well if you're like ad hoc doing some things, but there are some things to be desired. For instance, how are we going to deal with type classes and implicits? How do we, let's say I want to add methods to this new type. How am I going to do that? Can we make the casting a little bit safer, similar to how Haskell does coerce? And how can we reduce this boilerplate? There's like a lot of things that we have to do here to get this right. So let's try to formalize this approach into something that we can sort of optimize here. So we're going to start with this companion object called wi uh, widget ID. This is going to be our companion object where our implicits, our smart constructor, all that stuff can go. First, we're going to start with a, a base type. This is going to be the way the JVM is going to see this runtime type. We're going to use any here with a refinement. This refinement also helps Scala C to make this a unique type. Next, we're going to use this trait tag. The, this trait tag is used specifically to help with implicit resolution. It sort of anchors it to this, to this companion object. So it, it then makes any implicits that are there part of the search path. So you basically get implicit resolution for free this way. Now we're going to create, this is actually what our new type is. We're going to use this less colon, which is basically how you define an abstract type. It's abstract subtype. But for our means, this is useful to make sure Scala C doesn't try to expand our type alias at uh, compile time, which if it did, then that would break implicit resolution in certain cases. And then we just create a type widget ID on top. And this gives, it our, gives us our widget ID. So now we have our new type structure. We can then create an apply method that will do the cast for us. And if we want, we can also define this implicit final class ops. This is how you define extension methods in Scala. So this says, hey, if I have a widget ID, this is how you do the value method, which will give me back a string. And we're doing all the casting there. So this will just work, right? Anybody, fam everybody familiar with uh, extension methods, how they work here? OK. Now, here's how the new type would work. You, if you tried to call a string method on it, it wouldn't compile because it doesn't know. All, all it's seeing is this, is this abstract type that you defined. It doesn't know that it's a string, so it won't let you do that. However, it will let you call the value method because we defined it as an extension method. So this will compile. If you had a function that took a string, and you try to pass a string to it, obviously it works. You try to pass a widget ID, it's not going to compile. It's going to say, hey, I expected string, you gave me widget ID. If I had a function that expects widget ID, I try to pass it a string, hey, you gave me a string, I expected a widget ID. Pass it a widget ID, works. Does that make sense, the semantics of, of type checking on new types? OK, that was a lot of boilerplate, though. I don't want to have to write that every time, because again, I just want to get work done. So I'm going to create this like little builder trait. And I'm going to define everything like we did before. I'm even going to add this wrapper method to make it a little easier to cast the, um, the new type back to uh, its base type string or whatever it might be. Now, the problem here you'll notice is that while this works, we now have to define our extension methods inside the companion object, which is like, uh, OK, I guess. You know, um, still not fun. It's still a lot of boilerplate to write. But let's look at what it looks like at runtime. Here's our apply method. You'll see this actually invokes into the new type apply method, which again is just another load and return, which is another load and return. So, so far, so good. We're just loading and returning. So we're not having to do a bunch of extra operations. Um, if we look at this extension method, the way that this is getting called, you'll see that it's simply calling into the widget ID ops value extension method. So there's no uh, allocations occurring. You'll notice that there's also this like ops apply, but it's a no op. It's no, but it doesn't do anything. It's again a load and return. So if we look at that actual value method, we're going to see here that the only thing that we're really having to do here is we're having to do a check cast because that wrapper is just going to be a load and return. So that check cast, oops, the check cast is going to be really the only operation being done. So again, you're just getting it, returning it, and uh, because of the semantics of the JVM, it has to make sure that it's actually a string at runtime. What about generics if I'm trying to pass in into an option? Well, so far so good. We're just passing around an object, no new allocations, nothing like that as we would expect. Same thing if we're trying to extract. Just works. And we can use as instance of just as before for uh, constant time conversions. So no more having to map over and all that jazz. Load return as we'd expect. 
But you may, some of you care about primitives, right? Primitives have this problem of when you try to pass them around in this way, they're going to box. So int would box into a Java Lang integer. Um, this isn't really good because then you're like, okay, well, I'm at least eliminating one layer of boxing, but I don't want to have to also box the Java Lang integer. Um, so the way we deal with that, well, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the problem here real quick. So you'll see what happens here is that it actually ends up boxing here to, uh, to integer. This is not really what we want. Um, we want to try to avoid that. So let's try to create a new subtype. New subtype is going to basically function just like our new type, except it functions as a subtype. So you notice um, here, instead of the type being that refinement type, the type type is actually going to be based on the wrapper that we define. So in this case, it's going to be int. Um, so that way, at compile time, it should be able to compile it down, and then at runtime, you end up with an int. So let's, uh, let's see if we get this right. So after this definition, um, oh, excuse me. Uh, so first, let me talk about the semantics real quick. Um, so here we'll see that because feet is a subtype of int, if you can actually call int methods on it. This could be bad or this could be good, depending on your use case, right? In the case of not boxing primitives, this is the best we have for right now. And you may actually like this behavior, so it's up to you. Um, so if you want to have a method that takes ints, you can have it take feet. Now keep in mind, it's going to return an int at the end, right? Because it's going to go ahead and, and uh, widen that type. So ne next, if we have something that takes feet, however, and you pass it feet, of course it works. You try to pass it int, doesn't compile because it says, hey, I expected feet, you gave me int. So in this way, you sort of establish, hey, you, you know, you must at least give me feet. You can't give me um, int, right? I understand that feet is a subtype of int, but it's the same subtype relationships that we're used to. But is it really zero cost? Let's see what happens when we try to actually use this guy. Um, so when you try to construct it, we're going to see, oh, it's boxing the integer, and then it's unboxing the integer. Why is it doing that? Oh, well, you're going to notice that the apply method expects object. And the main reason for this is because we were using generics. Again, generics are erased. The type parameters are erased at compile time, so, so, or at runtime. So therefore, when you go to actually use this, you're just dealing with objects. And that's not what we want. So one way we could fix this, which is a complete hack, is overwrite it with int. But then, wait, uh, it's sort of doing it, except box to integer, unbox to int. I, Mr. Odersky, I don't know why this is happening, but um, I, I mean, really, uh, it, it, honestly, I submitted a bug to Scala C about this. This is really weird behavior. Um, but there is a way to get around this. Let's go ahead and pass this. Oh, this is for 2.12, by the way. In 2.12, you can get around this by passing the inline flag. Now, to be honest, I don't actually understand why this works, because those are Java methods. And um, there's a box and unbox flag that does not work with this, but the inline flag does work. And hey, it works. Yay, we're happy. So if you want to use new subtype, use this compiler flag, please. Let's check it. Yes. We're taking an int, returning an int. We're all good. So I mentioned coercible. Here's a way we could deal with coercible in, in Scala. Just create this type class. And for our new types, we can just implement those, right? So we just have this final def apply. And whenever we create our new type, we'll just have a to and from instance here defined. So this way, we can automatically go and use Coerce to string, to uppercase, bam, works, right? So um, that do, dot coerce, by the way, comes from we'll use an extension method or something so we don't have to invoke the coerce each time. Here, do uppercase, all of these work, right? So now let's say we wanted our constant time conversions. Well, we could create a coercible list. So now we can say, hey, so long as I can coerce A to B, I can coerce a list of B or a list of A to B. Does that make sense? Or a list of A to list of B. You get the idea. Now, currently, the way I'm doing this is I'm saying, hey, you know what? For any F, we can go ahead and coerce F of A to F of B. However, it's, I recently discovered that there's an issue with this. There are some data types where this doesn't work. 
Um, and so while the runtime representations are the same, the data structure you may be using may not semantically work with that sort of pattern. It may require some sort of validation or something. So I have a proposal on how to deal with this using type roles. And type roles is actually a concept that um, I actually discovered in Haskell first. And so the idea is to maybe there's a way we could try to implement type roles to deal with this. I'm not gonna get into that too much right now. I have an issue open about discussing this issue and figuring out the right way to do it. I don't think my current proposal is particularly great, but it's a proposal. And it may be pragmatic enough to get the ball rolling on it. I'm not sure yet. But now I'm gonna shill for my library called Scala New Type. I don't know, uh, has anybody uh, heard of this library before? Anybody, oh good, so, so shilling is working, all right. Uh, well, it works if you'll actually use it. For what it's worth, I'm using it, so hey. Um, and the clients I work with are using it, so. All right, anyways. Uh, <laughs> so here, we can just go ahead and import um, these macros, and bam, look, check this out. At new type case class widget ID value string. This looks like a regular case class, uh, case class definition, but this will actually expand into the new type definition that we had before. Same thing with new subtype. We can do the same thing, and this just magically works. Now, you might say, oh, but I have some specialized case or whatever, and hey, maybe that's the case, and you can write all the boilerplate you want. For, for my use case, I'm using this like 90, like 100% of the time. I basically never need another use case other than this. This also supports type parameters. It supports uh, type bounds on those type parameters. Uh, you can define methods inside and it will compile to extension methods for you. In the companion object, you can define implicits and they will just work. Um, with the case class, you automatically get the apply and the unapply methods. And the unapply has actually been optimized and actually optimizes pretty well with JIT, so you have good performance with unapply even though it wraps an option. So I, because these sorts of things are sort of tricky, I like adding this debug flag to macros. And so if you want to, you can actually pass in this debug flag and it will spit out the generated code at compile time. So you can look at it, so you're like, what is going on? Maybe you don't care, maybe you just wanna do it and if it works, great, but maybe you do care and you wanna see it, there you go, you can check it out. You'll notice it's the same structure defined. One thing that makes us a little different is that we're defining that apply method in line, so that this is why like new subtype will just work and you don't have that weird boxing behavior like we saw before because of the generic parameters. No generic parameters used here outside of the, the type aliases. You'll also notice there's this uh, deriving method that I have defined. Nice thing about this guy is that we can use this to derive type class instances automatically. Haskell has this notion called uh, a, a new type, a generic new type deriving. Um, and it allows us to do something like that. So this gets us, again, it's not as good as Haskell, but it gets us part of the way there. So here's what it might look like. Maybe you have this attributes new type, which is just a wrapper around list of string string. And you want, hey, I just want to use the modoid instance for list. I just want it to work, right? Well, bam, done. Like it will just automatically infer the one for list and just pull it in and it works. Oh, and one thing I might add is that most things with this new type library will just work in your IDE. Um, for those of you using Scala, who's using IntelliJ? Okay, so basically everyone, right? Um, pretty much everything works with IntelliJ and that was by design. That's why I use case classes and classes because IntelliJ can automatically resolve when you do command click or control uh, square bracket, whatever you wanna do to jump to definition. All of that stuff just works and you don't have to worry about one of, my, one of my biggest pet peeves is when macros generate things and the IDE just throws up everywhere, right? I can't, it really bothers me. So this will just work for you. Oh, however, I, I literally lied on accident. All right, so this deriving, however, because this is a generated method, this will appear red. That's the one thing. And I'm looking at ways of dealing with that because I think IDE support is a really, really big priority. Again, to get things done, I don't want things to be in your way and you question whether or not this works. But this is one edge case, and I talk about this in the README if you're curious, so. And if you have an idea on how to do it, PR is welcome. Now, what if, what if you have a kind of type like slice, where it's a slice A, right? Well, you can use deriving K. Again, it's not as nice as Haskell, it'll just figure it out, but in this case, it's pragmatic enough to go ahead and get the job done so we can just get back to work. You can also customize your smart constructors. So if you don't use the case portion of a case class, it won't export an apply method. And that way you can define your own smart constructor 
So you can go ahead and wrap this guy as you'd expect. Exa exactly like you do with the case class or class, right? E exactly the same semantics as you do before. So the same, pr uh, the same patterns you're used to, you can use with this library. So of course, this doesn't work because there's no apply method, but this does. Does your validation for you. Now here's an example, I'm not really gonna walk through it too much, but here's an example of what you can do with it. Let's say we wanted to create a, an unboxed option type called maybe. So what this allows you to do is actually define an optional type that doesn't box around like an, how an option does. An option has to box the value. In this case, if we get a null, we just swap it out for this singleton empty value. And then from there, we can just check that. And we do the, the same sort of checks as before, except we don't have to worry about you know, wrapping and unwrapping. So the map and flat map and all that stuff, no wrapping and unwrapping. You just get it for free. It's pretty nice. Here's another example of how you could use this. You could use this for monad transformers. So maybe you want to create option T, but you don't want to incur the overhead of having to wrap and unwrap your option T every single time. This does the same thing. And actually, I ripped this definition um, from Cats or Scala Z, whichever one you use. Um, actually, I think it's pronounced Scala Z, but it's up to you all to decide that. So yeah, you just rip that definition out, paste it right there. I, I ripped out the implicits, dumped them in. It all works just as you'd expect. So you guys said you knew about shapeless. So I'm, I'm gonna start by saying, I think shapeless is actually a phenomenal library. I actually really like it. Um, many times the overhead performance of shapeless is not my concern and I just use it because it helps me scrap the boilerplate that I just really don't want to write. And, and a lot of times, you know, depending on what you're doing, it can almost be more correct to use shapeless because you can sort of prove that you've dealt with all the fields. You want, oh no, I added a field and it has a default value in the constructor and now all of a sudden it doesn't work. Well, you sort of get around that by ensuring that you can use shapeless to prove that you dealt with all the fields. But aside that, aside from saying it's a good library, I'm gonna still say there's some things I don't like about it and things that we can improve and get closer to zero cost. So let's look at this foo type. It has two fields. And so we could construct a foo like that and we can use generic, which comes from shapeless, to construct the generic form of this. In this case, it's gonna be an H list. And it's pretty much always some form of h list. And so we end up with an int string h nil. So um, I think this should make sense to everybody, especially if you all attended the, the shapeless talk. So basically we do that, right? But something seems weird because if I were to compare this, the, my original foo with the g, with the h list, it's not gonna be the same value, right? It, obviously, because we constructed this h list. And you may think, okay, what, one allocation for an H list? Well, actually, no, that's not true. Whenever you construct an H list, it actually looks more like this. For every field in your case class, you're constructing a new uh, H cons, if you will, right? So you're doing this each, each step of the way. Again, it's usually I'm like, I'll pay the price, but for the sake of this talk, hey, let's find a way to not pay the price, right? Because that's fun. So, to review, here's what hlist looks like. We start with this trade hlist, and it has two, and then you have the hcons constructor for hlist, which can take a head and a tail. The tail obviously being another hlist, and your sort of termination condition is h nil, right? Well, how could we encode this differently to avoid runtime overhead? Seems like maybe we don't have a way, or maybe we do. So what if we created something called a G list? Honestly, I'm naming these different just to disambiguate. Um, so have fun with it. And I'm gonna do the hash colon operator for my cons operator. Now you're gonna no notice something different. I don't have fields here. I don't have any fields here. I don't have the head, I don't have the tail. So you're probably thinking, okay, is he you know, playing a game? And then we do G nil just as normal. So let's see how this might actually work. Well, I'm gonna create a new type uh, called glist.of. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, it's gonna have two type parameters, A and L, where L is the glist. And this is what's called a phantom type. Has anybody, has, has, who has heard of phantom types before? So for those of you who haven't, phantom types are basically types that go into, that, that are a type parameter, but they're not actually part of the value. 
right? So this allows us to, to ha add type information without changing the runtime representation of the value. You guys might already know where I'm going with this. So what we can do then is we can also define a coercible instance to say, hey, if I have a of, that's a bad name saying it like that, but whatever. If we have an of of a from h to tail, right, then we can cast it to a to tail, right? Because we're just going to take that same runtime value and use type information. This guy's laughing over here, heckler. Um, so if uh, we can take that type information and use that to resolve which field we actually want to pull. So generic products, let's look how this will look. Look how this will look, jeez. All right, so G product. Uh, we're, this is very similar to how shapeless is generic works. It's the same thing except I have it specialized for products because we're keeping this simple. We have this type wrapper here, which is, must be an, a G list. And we have, this is standard aux pattern you may be familiar with. This is just so we can get a hold of that represent, the, the wrapper type if we need to via implicit resolution. And we're gonna have this to method, which allows us to say, hey, given an A, if I have a G product for it, I can cast it to a G list. And I'm just using glist of. I don't have to do any direct casting here. The glist of is going to do the casting for me. So far, so good. So how do we actually access the fields of this magical thing? All right, we're going to use a type class called isGcons. It has two inner types, head and tail. From there, we can say, I'm going to have a def head, right? And given an A, I can get the head. Given the tail, I'm just going to coerce it. I'm just going to coerce it. And that's it. There's nothing really to be done here. I'm just going to say, hey, you want the tail? Here's the same value I just, you just gave me. It's the same thing, because I'm just going to use type information from isGcons to resolve which method to execute. So and again, use the aux pattern so we can resolve the head and the tail a little easier than having to use the refinement types. So again, Macro, because we don't want to you know, have to write all this code out every single time. And not to mention that I'm not a huge fan of automatically deriving instances. Um, this means that sometimes you'll have more allocations than you intend. And honestly, maybe there's some types you don't want to have uh, generic deriving for. Um, Haskell sort of enforces that you must have your types uh, derive deriving in order to do this. Um, or, uh, excuse me, derive generic in order to do this. And I, I think it's a good strategy and this sort of forces you to do that. So using this, what ends up happening is it ends up generating these implicits. For is gcons of our first field with the tail, it just accesses the A field, then the B field, then the C field, then the D field, right? So as you traverse down into the list, it's just pulling a different method. So far, so good. Makes sense, right? So we're using type information to dispatch the appropriate method we want to access the fields on our value without having to box that value at all. We're using only type information. Next, it just derives this. And we use gproduct.instance, which is literally the same instance value. Because again, this is a type only value. You don't actually need to allocate anything for any of this, for the, for the g product, that is. For the gcons, you kind of do because you need to know how to dispatch that method. So, but outside of that, um, I think it's in like Java 8, uh, in, in Scala 2.12, a lot of those turn into lambdas anyway, and so that becomes a little bit better to optimize. Oh. What are the functional dependencies Functional dependencies? Yeah. Let's go back. What do you mean? Why? Are you saying H and T are dependent on A? No. No, because it's going to resolve this implicitly based on the value that you have. So there's only going to be one A, right? I mean, it, I, again, in theory, you could define multiple implicits, right, for A, but that's not really going to be an issue here. Well, you do have multiple implicits, right? For, oh, 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 I, I see what you're saying. Okay, I was thinking G product. Um, well, in this case, right, you do have multiple implicits, but it's using the H and T, because there's only, okay, there's only one instance of each head and tail combination. So whenever you're summoning that value, it's, it's going to have to look up the one specifically for that. So like, let's say you wanted to pull just A, right? That's not gonna be good enough and you're probably gonna get ambiguous, you're gonna get you know, ambiguous implicit error, right, at compile time. So you can't just summon an is gcons for A necessarily unless you only have one field. Does that make sense? Okay. Can you go back to 
the previous slide? Sure. Finding out that this decon one is taking full and double, and decon two is taking full and float. And double and genome, yeah. Yes. What happened to the string guy? I'm sorry? Yes. Yes, a, a is a is a string. So, um, well, how about, how about this? How about this? Um, if you want, we can sync up, and maybe we can talk about this in in more detail. Um, I understand a lot of this is kind of weird. You're doing like a lot of just type only stuff, and that's how you're resolving all this. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but definitely feel free to sync up with me after the fact if anybody has questions or anything. Um, if, if like, I'm not able to address it right here, we can maybe go in, in greater depth. So let's say we want to do something silly like a CSV encoder. You should probably never do it the way that I'm about to do it, but we're going to do it anyway because it's a simple example. We're just going to encode an A to a string. So the way that we can actually derive this instance uh, using the things we had before if you, if you have learned now, based on the talks you've seen or your experience in the past, how to do it with shapeless, it's nearly identical to the same pattern you're used to doing in the past. So we're going to start with an implicit GCon. So again, this is going to return, we can use a CSV encoder of a G list of A for its head and tail, right? Given that we have the encoder for H, the head, the encoder for the tail, and we can prove that this is indeed a GCONS. And that allows us to then access the head and tail of A. And the way we're going to do that in this particular case, we use extension methods to do it, but you could easily do is gcons.head pass it A, right? Same sort of deal. It's the same thing. And then our termination case is going to be when we have just one element left in the list, and that's going to be the head and nil, or g nil, right? The end of the list. So that's going to be our last field where we have our, uh, the head encoder, and we prove that, all right, this is a cons of the head and gnil. So far, so good. So this is the same sort of shapeless pattern you've probably seen before. The only difference is we have like is gcons, because we're not accessing the head and tail directly. Oh, forgot to show that one. It's the same thing. You could have guessed that, right? And it works. So if we define. Um, our derivation that way, we try to run it, bam, it works, and we're good to go. So this is a way that we could leverage something like, like shapeless, but actually encode its H list without having to incur runtime overhead. And we get the exact same functionality. The only functionality we don't get is we can't access dot head and dot tail directly, but we can fix that with extension methods. And again, those can be zero cost so long as you make those extend any value. But overall, thank you very much. Um, here's some links to the new type library. Here's the cache implementation as well as the G product imp implementation. Um, again, you'll have access to the slides here. Um, so y'all can feel free to go through it. I think I have uh, about seven minutes or so. So if y'all want to ask some questions or anything that y'all didn't get a chance to ask yet. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, wait a second, because sometimes it takes one and then. See, now, now some, but no, I'm kidding. Um, well, cool. Um, I'll be hanging around. Uh, oh, oh, was that a hand raise? Wow. There we go. Oh, please, hey, please. Uh, on criticisms, I'm totally fine with. Okay, so the question was, is this sort of evidence that Scala is lacking and Haskell is amazing? No, that's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, was, I was paraphrasing. I was making it a little less PC, I guess. Um, the, the fact is, is that, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I kind of started with that in the beginning here, is that Scala is lacking out of a lot of the features that Haskell has. Um, and this is just sort of an attempt to try to improve upon that. Um, so, you know, a lot of these are like, hey, you know, how can we do that without having to, like, write a bunch of boilerplate every single time? Because, again, 
like most of you, you're trying to get your job done and we just need to like, get through this and have abstractions that just work and are efficient. Um, so yeah, hopefully that sort of answers your question. It's sort of an opinion, but I mean, objectively, yes, Scala is lacking relative to Haskell. Yes. <coughs> Mm-hmm. Is it the case that no, you don't have to go through this because someone already did this for us in Haskell? No way. Oh, oh, are you saying you don't have so you don't have to go through macros in Haskell because Haskell just already does this? Is that your yeah, question? It's already, it's already covered this for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean really this idea from my perspective comes from Haskell. The only reason why I'm doing it is is I'm like, I can do this in Haskell. Why can't I do this in Scala? Yeah. And so, you know, I'm going with it like that. So thank you. Oh, absolutely, thank you. So um I watched the presentation of uh, opaque types uh -huh. earlier in, in, in the conference. Uh, it seems to me that it does more yes. than that, mm -hmm. more than Pascal, and with less trouble. So. <laughs> well, you, you, think that, you think that writing out your module definition and you know, having to remember to uh, you know, ascribe the type and all that. You think that's actually easier than just annotating new type on a case class? And I mean, if, if that's your opinion, that's fine, right? I so, mean, all the, the stuff you're doing there, I think it's, it's more than uh, the opaque types. Right? Oh, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. So, it is the current encoding of new type more complex than the way scholars the opaque types are going to be? Is that, is that your point? Well, no, no, no. I, I actually agree. I, I, I was there for the opaque type talk, and I thought that it was really interesting because I, I think that the encoding proposed does seem simpler, and that's probably something that we could find a way to, to use um, in this, and it would be the same. Now, arguably, from my perspective, those sort of things are more of like implementation details in terms of the library, right? Like the user of the new type library shouldn't really have to worry about how we're encoding the type information, they can, right? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with understanding how it's encoded and you can, like I showed, you could debug and print it out. But the idea is that you don't really have to worry about that, that the encoding works. Um, but I think your point is valid. I think your point is valid in that there, um, that the encoding could definitely be simpler. And, and, I, and I got the same impression whenever I watched the opaque types talk as well, for what it's worth. So, so I, I agree with you in that regard. But I will say one challenge is that because this is defined in an object, that makes it a little different because it's harder to, it's harder to hide that type information in the object, but that's, again, more of an implementation detail sort of deal. So, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, since you did so much related to libraries that people are working on, you know, like shapeless and all, are mm -hmm. you going to be contributing what you did to them? To shapeless? Um, well, okay, so I considered this, and maybe, but I have a feeling that it's not, it, it's more like we probably need something new in Shapeless, rather than that, like you say, okay, change the way hless work in Shapeless. That sounds like a pretty breaking change that doesn't sound very fun for anybody to have to deal with. Um, so it doesn't seem necessarily worthwhile to me. Yeah, so, so yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there are lots of things that are in Shapeless that are currently implemented and totally based on the current implement, implementation of HList that, again, it, I mean, it, well, he's saying it's not possible. I don't know, and he might be right. I don't, I can't vouch for that necessarily, but. You have to forget about using a generic and think, what other things are doing this? And you will very quickly find things that you cannot do with, with an opaque uh, wrapper or on and Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And, and, and that, that would be an interesting uh, sort of thing to look into. Now for my cases, I'm, again, 100% of the time I'm using HLS for generic der derivation. So for, for me, it wasn't, it's not really an issue necessarily. But, you know, that's, but, but basically to, to answer your question, yeah, no, I don't think that that would be something that, again, Shapeless might, maybe, maybe I might contribute something like that to Shapeless, say, hey, here's an option for you. But overall, I don't, I don't know that it's in the same vein of, or shapeless, the, the kind of idea behind shapeless. So. What about contributing new type to Scala itself? 
Well, okay. Oh, you know, and that's really something. Um, that there, there, it is in the works that, that opaque types could find themselves in Scala 2.13. Um, you can already play with them in Dottie. Um, but one of the nice things about using this new type encoding is that for many of us who probably will never get to use Scala 2.13 for several decades, um, we'll, probably, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll probably value being able to use this. Not to mention that this means that this code could say, hey, for Scala 2.13, compile to an opaque type, if that even makes sense in this case. Um, there might be certain features that this allows for that um, opaque types won't be able to do. So that's the other thing is that this is also extensible and we can decide how we want to compile for different versions of Scala. So. Um, one last question. Have you played with uh, boxing and boxing issues with uh, Scala.js? Um, well, for, well, I've actually used this library. Well, uh, someone submitted a PR to say, hey, uh, can we add uh, Scala.js um, support for new type? And uh, I accepted that PR, we got that merged in. And, but before I did, I wanted to actually play with it and see if it worked, and it does. In fact, it seems to work better in Scala.js. It's really, it, Scala.js is very interesting to me. I don't have a use case for it personally. Um, but this sort of approach does work in Scala.js. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, I think it's about time, and I am about to get kicked out. So thank you, everybody, again, for your time. I really appreciate it.